we still got people out here playing church. Like they don't think there's anything wrong. Like the amount of whack preachers out there, whack preachers looking for their own, uh, looking for their own optics moment to get a picture with politicians that are as crooked as a dog's hind leg. Looking for these optics of trying to get a picture with the mayor who's more compromised than Ahab himself in the Bible. We, we, all these, all these optics. Oh, we got this person like, screw it. If your city council people are not living for Jesus, don't be platforming them. Hey, welcome to the Not A Fitted Podcast. This is your boy, Anthony, the conservative Chicano, sitting right here. I got the bishop and the token in the house. We want to welcome everybody. This is where we talk about culture and the influence on the church. I want to take a special moment right now and thank all the listeners who tune in every week, leave comments, all the stuff that's going on. You find us on Spotify, iTunes, and of course, YouTube. We're so grateful for all of y'all who tune in every week to hear what we got to say. And uh, normally at this part of the, you know, the, the program, I talk about a comment. And I talked about what's going on. And I wasn't, um, you ever just felt like you don't want to argue with nobody? Has that ever happened to you? I mean, I, I, I know you've been married for some years now. You ever just, you ever just get into an, an argument with your wife? Like, I don't want to argue. I'm, I'm just, I'm not even going to say nothing. Has that ever happened? Uh, there's never really a day where I want, <laughs> when I want to argue with anybody. Good save right there. No, I, I, your wife watches I, just, this. <laughs> I, just, I don't like arguing at all. You guys will start talking and I'll just be like, I'll just watch. Did, has that ever happened to you? Like, like you, you, you know, you're right, but you don't want to argue. It's like, it's going to be a waste of good quality air. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I don't argue anymore. You, uh, yeah. You just rather do it, huh? Just don't, not going to argue. Is there a chance care. that you would not be right? Is there a chance I wouldn't, wouldn't be right about something? I'm, I'm open to it. <laughs> so I, so go, the reason I bring that up is I get this comment. I get this comment and this person, I, I, don't, I don't know who they are. Um, if you have pronouns, I don't know if you do or not. I, I just don't know nothing about this person. So I'm not trying to be offensive. What does that mean if you have pronouns? Well, I don't know if this person has pronouns, wants me to call them by their pronouns. I, I don't know. I'm just saying, I just threw it out. I'm trying, <laughs> I'm turning it over a new leaf. But what does that even mean? What if they go to our church? Well, that, I don't know if they do or not. I'm, you know what? See, me trying to be nice gets me in trouble. What I'm trying to say is I don't want to say anything overtly offensive right now. So I'm just, I'm just trying to say this person. So I don't know if this person wants to be identified as they, them. Zizers. Okay, so them there. If they did, you would call them that. Probably not. Okay. <laughs> Why you set me up like that? Because I'm, trying, yourself to, I'm trying to understand what you're saying. And I was trying to be nice anyway. This person, see, now I don't even know what to say. Okay, this person saying that COVID is no worse than the flu is ridiculous. Saying that the death toll is wrong is ridiculous. There were refrigerator trucks full of bodies because morgues were full of dead people. There were mass graves being dug for the, uh, dug for the excess of dead bodies. You can't pretend like COVID wasn't a serious issue. So they missed the whole point of what I was even trying to articulate. I didn't say... And then they went on to say, you need to provide links. So I provided links. I didn't say that it was no worse than the flu. The CDC said. And the CDC said has come out and they've rebuffed themselves and corrected themselves on all sorts of things. So why people get, people, people have a bad habit of shooting the messenger and not listening to the message. And so I was simply trying to say, there's reasons now, there's, 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 there's ancillary reasons, there's anecdotal evidence, there's all these things on why this stuff had happened. I, and, and by the way, I agreed with you guys when I said Andrew Tate should have said it was a hoax. I, we all agreed that it was a poor choice of words. That's not what I was saying. What I'm saying is all this. Okay, it's like this. Is this person going to get mad because uh, Bricks, Dr. Bricks, do you guys remember her? She was with Dr. Fauci and they were trying to navigate the two weeks to slow this. Do you guys remember her? Mm -hmm. Okay. Dr. Bricks in a tell-all book wrote, and I quote, that my plan was never two weeks to slow the spread, but I knew I could never convince the Trump administration to only shut down for two weeks. If I would have walked in there and said six weeks, they would have told me no, and they would have never done what I asked to do. So I knew that I didn't have the evidence to back up two weeks to slow the spread, but if I could get two weeks and I could scurry along and scramble along and find all the evidence to back up that we need to shut down for longer. Mm -hmm. So what I'm simply saying is now that looking back retrospectively, we just didn't, it was never, there was so many things thrown out the window that it was built up to be something that it wasn't. That's all I was ever saying. 
And so I, I don't know. Do you guys have a thought about that? Like I, I wasn't arguing that none of this was, wasn't real, that, that we weren't back, backed up in hospitals. And I went on to say the reason, if you look at, if you look at a bar graph of every year, by the way, do you guys know the leading cause of death every year? Heart disease? It is heart disease. Okay, so would it shock you that heart disease fell by like 50% when COVID hit the spot? Because it didn't fall. Hmm. That's what I'm saying. That that's where that's where people miss the whole point. It didn't fall. You just started listing everything as COVID because you were monetarily incentivized. Yeah, it just reminded me of what the state of New York did. Go ahead. Uh, the state of New York, re, uh, I don't know if the word would be retracted, but they had to come out and and fix the the, the statistics right. that they had put out, which were people who had died of COVID. Right. No, with COVID. No, no, no. Yeah, but they, but yeah, they originally said yeah, uh, they, with, yeah. they died uh, because of COVID. Yeah. They had all these really super high numbers, and then they were forced to come back and correct mm -hmm. those numbers mm -hmm. because they were, you know, people who had been shot in the head, and they and, got oh COVID. died of COVID. Um. So it was just stuff like right. that. Like that's a very crazy example, but it was other people who had very serious illnesses or or different accidents that were being listed as dying of COVID. And the first person to break this was Brinson, a journal, uh, a, a writer um, who used to write for the New York Times. Brinson and I started following him, and he started um, he started the hard task of really digging into things, and he got canceled quicker than anybody I'd ever seen. Now, let me throw something out there to, uh, that popped up on my, my memories uh, in, my, in my Facebook since we're on this note. Do you remember the first basketball player to, to test positive for – because he went on he went on Good Morning America, and he talked about it, and he was in isolation. He was asymptomatic. Rudy Gobert was the first one that mentioned it. Okay. Oh, got it. Okay, so got it. But this was the first player who went on an interview. Do you remember? Oh, I don't know. Okay, so this pops up on my timeline. And here's the funny thing. Have you guys ever had the flu? Yes. Are you sure? No. Okay, have well, you had the know. flu? I've been sick. Okay, I've had the flu. I have yet to meet. How do you know? Okay, because I took a flu test and it said I had the flu. Oh, okay. Okay, okay. I mean, that's okay. But I have a question. Have you ever met anybody who was asymptomatic with the flu? Nah, I doubt it. Okay, up until COVID and then people being asymptomatic, have you ever heard of asymptomatic before in your entire life? Probably not. Have you? Oh, yeah, I don't think so. Okay, so in other words, what I'm saying to you is, Hey, Mike, you have to go isolate in a room for 14 days because I tested you and it says you have the flu. Even though you don't have one lick of symptoms, you got to sit in your room and don't come into contact with nobody. You're going to do what? Be a good boy and go sit in my room. Lying right now to everybody who watches the podcast. What I'm saying is there were things, I, this is my personal opinion. You all can comment, you know, maybe it's more prevalent than I know. A lot of nurses watch this. You could just tell me. But what, what I'm saying is I feel like the thing that got people turned off about the whole COVID thing is you constantly move the goalpost. Mm. And, and half the people felt like you were making up stuff. Only time in America we didn't throw everything in the kitchen sink at something to try to make somebody get better. We started ostracizing people. And that was the whole thing I was trying to make up is, is now that we're looking back four years now, four years, right? have been looking at COVID in the rearview mirror for four years, stuff was blown out of proportion. And, and listen, don't hit me with the, you know, we had to go out and dig new graves and the morgues were overrun. We stopped treating people. Cancer skyrocketed. Heart disease skyrocketed. Diabetes skyrocketed. We already have those three problems as the three biggest killers. So of course, if we're not treating the people and we're making people jump through all these hoops to where like, if you have a sore throat, don't even show up. Of course, those death tolls are going to go up. And if you test the person when they're dead and they had COVID, what did you mark them with? Dead by COVID. That's all I was saying. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I move on, I move on, I move on. So the world we live in, the world we live in. So um, I'm driving yesterday. And I'm trying to connect my phone to. Uh, I have a pretty, uh, I have a pretty ritualistic Sunday thing that I do. I just, I'm a creature of habit, and on Sundays, I turn on my worship music, and it's like an all praise hour as I'm going from campus to campus and all this stuff. And but I can't get my phone to connect to my car, and I'm like, I'm running a little bit behind. I hate being late. You know, five minutes early is on time. On time is late. That's just me. And so. 
Uh, I can't get my phone to connect to car. And my 80s channel is on in my, my car, Sirius XM 80s channel. And they're doing the hits of this time in March in 1985. And lo and behold, I came to the realization, I love me some March of 1985 music. I started listening. They're playing all the great hits. I, I just, I can't believe it. I'm just, man, so much good music in 85. And I'm quickly thought back to like 1985 and I'm doing the math in my head and I'm like, Dude, I'm like I'm like eight or nine years old, depending on when it hits in '85. I'm like, what was I doing back then? I thought, man, this is the world I was living in. We didn't have iPads and phones. I was hoping to get that new BMX bike. Movies like Rad came out, where it was a BMX movie, and I was starting to think about all these things. Goonies was coming out. All this stuff that took me back and and playing in the you know when did you know to go home when the streetlights came on, and I'm just going down this nostalgic time in my life, and I'm thinking, what are kids being raised in today? Mm. What are kids going through today? They're eight years old trying to figure out what gender they are because some teacher who's got a whacked agenda is trying to instill in them that they, that they could be a pony, that they could be a furry and a fluffy. And I'm thinking about this is the world we live in. Mm -hmm. Have you thought about that? That the world we live in right now has got preachers who are more concerned about followers than making disciples. I mean followers. I'm not talking about followers of Christ. I'm talking about Instagram followers trying to, trying to elevate their platform, trying to make it all about them when it should be all about God. I don't know. What do you, what do you, what do you think? What, what do you think about what I'm saying right now? Like this is the world we live. Like describe right now the world we live in. Well, right away I started laughing because I was like, hey, Deshaun, what were you thinking about in 1985? <laughs> Wasn't born yet. <laughs> <laughs> That's what's wrong with you guys. That, I, was, that, I was getting ready wrong. to celebrate my first birthday. Oh, okay. Um, uh, yeah, you know, we, the two of us, we have young kids. So, um, you know, th those types of things, they, I think about them a lot, like the world that, you know, our kids are growing up in is just, it's crazy. It's just, um, the public school systems, the entertainment industry, um, all the different things that are brought to their attention, like constantly, uh, you know, having to navigate hard conversations at a young age where you got, you know, a kid in first grade who's you know sitting next to my kid in class and you know trying to convince him that him's a her and he can do whatever he wants and all these different things and trying to explain that to a sixth grade uh, a, a, you know a six-year-old who's like no him's a him uh -huh. you know and so it, just even those conversations it's hard it's hard to navigate that what do you think about the world we live in right now um i'm, I'm not afraid of it i'm more just you know encouraging like saying mike encourage my kids just make sure they're able to face the world make sure i give them the tools to face it um i know i feel like i can face anything but make sure they're able to face these things going on and hopefully us as believers we keep standing for our faith that like you know at least have some resistance to what's going on in the world okay the reason i bring up this the world we live in did you ever think growing up as a kid and i'm about to show you our first clip uh pete Buttigieg, i believe this is his husband uh, and if I need to be corrected, then I'd be corrected. But Pete Buttigieg is the Transportation Secretary of the United States. And he was once, uh, was it in uh, Indianapolis or in Illinois? Or he was some Midwest state. Uh, he was like a mayor or something, Pete Buttigieg. He tried to run for presidency. He didn't even come close. But I, I want to show you this clip. And did you think that we would ever be living in a world that literally supports this? Watch this clip. All right. I pledge my heart. Rainbow. The not so typical gay camp. One camp. Full of pride. Indivisible. Affirmation and equal rights for all. Affirmation and equal rights for all. Watch your heads. Can I can I get you guys' thoughts on that, Bishop? What, what's your first thought on that? What, what what did you think when you saw that? This is the world we live in. Um, when he went to that camp, he did not have to. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about your time at that camp, B. Thanks, B. I was going to say something crazy, but then give you a chance to think. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, if my kids were up there, I'd be upset. This is um, the world we live in. Or, or, or unless, I mean, maybe some parents maybe knew what they were going to, what it would be like. But yeah, it's unfortunate. What, but you wonder why the kids are confused. Yeah. yeah. What do you think? What do you think about that? Pledging allegiance to a flag. Yeah, uh, first thing I was like, if that was uh, an advertisement, they did a very poor job because they, you know, they looked at the one kid who was like, I hate being here. I hate being here. <laughs> um, 
you know, I, I see stuff like that and I and I go, okay, what if we were to do something on the up opposite side of the okay. spectrum, right? So it's like we have a straight camp for young kids. And, you know, you have you have a straight camp for all young boys. Like, okay. could you imagine what people would say? It's like I pledge the allegiance to being a straight young man. And then as sexualized as they do all that stuff, right. then you're going to do it on the completely other side. So sponsored by Hooters. Sponsored by Hooters. And then you could just. Or no, no. We, it's wings and things now. Wings and things. Right. You know, hey, we're going to talk about how proud we are to be misogynistic or we're going to talk about how proud we are to, you know, how it's great to sleep around all these different women. And like, that's the other side of the coin. So I just see that. And I go, this is crazy. Their, their train of thought is just is, is whacked out. One nation under this flag. Right. Diversity, equity and inclusion. We accept in all women. See how bad that sounds? Like that right there is going to get us in trouble. Someone's going to clip that. Yeah, That's for yeah, sure going to get me in you're trouble. To, yeah, you're I'm toast. screwed. But, but I agree with you. But this is the world we live in. This is the world we live in. And I'm thinking, and you wonder why our kids are so jacked up right now. You got them all over the place. They just can't be kids. They can't, they can't be worried about going out and just playing ball in the street. They can't be worried about just riding their bikes at a friend's house. Nope. We got to put them on social media platforms. We got to do stupid stuff like this. And you wonder why the kids are jacked up. You wonder why they're so confused. And I got to thinking like, and I'm not trying to be Mr. I'm trying to live back in the 80s nostalgic over here. We just didn't have these types of problems. And people say, well, we weren't as advanced. Well, if this is what you call advancement, take me back. Because this isn't. Let, let me throw something out there. Okay, let me, let, me, let, me just, let me just ask you guys a question. For being so advanced... You would think, you would think if there was this, if there was this new type of therapy, and whatever, whatever it was a combination between chemo and radiation, right, for cancer. If there was this new type of therapy, this wonder pill, that could that could reduce a, a cancer patients, right? Like like let's say out of hundred cancer patients, it could heal seventy of them. Would that not be the hottest ticket in town? Wouldn't we be supporting that, throwing all our weight at that, be like, man, this is great. Now 70 out of 100 people don't have to die from cancer. Wouldn't we just be parading that around like, hey, we have found it. This, this, and we would see a drastic decline in what? In cancer, the totality of cancers with breast cancer, uh, pancreatic cancer, no matter what cancer it is, we would see that statistical bar graph go what? Down. Am I right in that? Because we found this pill and we're like, okay, instead of being, you know, in the in the upper 80%, now because seven out of ten are, are cured, but that's gonna be down to the 30 percentile, right? 25, 30 percentile. You would think with the advancement of therapy and therapist and counselors and all the money that is thrown at treatments, you would think statistically, statistically. You would think that people would be getting healthier, healthier psychologically, healthier when it comes to the emotional quotient, healthier with all of it that's thrown at him. We're starting at such a young age now. You got toddlers going to therapy. You would think statistically we'd be getting better. And what if I told you statistically we're showing we're getting worse? So you got to ask the question, why? Why is this? And it's stuff like this. You're introducing way too much, too young, and kids cannot process that stuff. You, you know why they start with the kids? Because you can almost convince kids of anything. Right now, if you went home and you told your kids, that, hey, you could be Superman, let's start getting you to jump off roofs, what would your boys do? Lace them up. <laughs> yeah, let's go. They, try, they, they would try it. Because, because th this, this is the world we live in. It's too much. It's too fast. And this has got me really concerned. So this, are people not really finding their authentic selves? No, that, mm -hmm. that, listen, listen, I, I, I love what, I love what Jordan Peterson, not this, this will help somebody out there. I love what Jordan Peterson said about helping, helping with part of a cure for social anxiety. He's not saying this is the cure all, but he's helping with part of the cure for social anxiety. If you find yourself getting social anxiety when you're going to, uh, uh, like, like a mingle for a business, um, like we do even do that in the church. We do, we do, um, uh, parties, not the party like the world parties, but like we do parties where other pastors can meet other pastors, all this stuff, right? If you find yourself getting a little social anxiety, he goes, I have one step that will radically help the majority of people. Stop thinking about you. Mm. Take a friend who doesn't know anybody in that group and make it your endeavor to introduce this person to 10 people you know and your social anxiety will go away. 
because now you have a purpose bigger than yourself. And the problem is if you focus on yourself too much, all that does is heighten the more anxiety. But this is the world we live in. Okay, as if that's not bad enough, um, I, I saw something, and I know you guys, last week we tried to show a clip of, what was his name, Cannibal? General no, Cannibal? Uh, no, no, uh, Barbecue. Barbecue. <laughs> oh, but he is a cannibal, my bad. And that got pulled off. That that It literally got pulled off all social media platforms. Yeah, he was literally pulling that leg off. That's what he was doing. <laughs> and I don't blame it for getting pulled off. That's that's a bad tongue-in-cheek right there. I don't, I'm not mad it got removed. Okay, so I <laughs> that didn't work either. No, that didn't no, work either. No. Okay, I'm glad they took it down. How about that one? So that's better. So I sent I I, I came across something uh, by an independent an independent journalist going on. I believe it's in Philadelphia. You know, when I first saw that, my heart broke. Like, people are, are, are that far, have fallen that far that they're trying to shoot drugs literally in their brain. I don't know, what was your first thought? <laughs> that was pretty, it was pretty bad. Like, what'd you think? Like, like. Oh uh, yeah, I, I got a, I got a weak a, I got a weak stomach. But so. looking in a car, <laughs> looking in a car window to try to find something to shoot up in. Yeah, that's it's that's that's bad. That's really bad. That's the world we live in right now, and and yet our and yet our government wants to give out the drugs. Clean needle program. Clean needle program. Open the borders. I'm sure no drugs come across the border. Let me ask you something. It, it, let me let me ask you, and I'm just, I'm being real. I'm being honest. No no tongue in cheek here. Do you think if America really wanted to solve the drug problem, they could? Um, Not completely. Nothing ever is completely solved, but I'm talking drastically reduce it. Can get it get a lot better, yeah. Then why don't we? Uh, I don't think people want to make things better um, who are in power. They want to keep power and they want to make money. So you think they're okay with that? That's somebody's daughter right there. You think they're okay with that? People like, they get to live free. Let's try to... They'll say they want to help them, but you can't force them. The, the people just, I don't think people in power really care that much. They want you, to make money. They want to keep power. You agree with them? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if the the reasons we agree are the same, but I definitely think that people who are in power want to keep power so that they, they can stay there. And so if if you fix the border crisis, you fix these different things, then what's the, what's to run on? I mean, he said that before. It's like, what what do I use in order to keep my, my power play? Um, if you if you solve everything, so you so what I'm hearing you guys say is this is just a game to people. Oh yeah, I mean if you've ever been in in like a courtroom and you see like a DA versus uh, you know a defense attorney, it's just a game for them. Like the person who might be going to jail for the rest of their life, like that's their lives, right? The people who have been affected by this person who might go to jail for the rest of their life, that's their lives. But for the for the judge and for the DA and everybody, it's just a game. Do you so know, when you're in power, it's just a game. Do you know why I say it's just a game? Do you remember when I, I might get this name wrong? We remember when Xi Jinping from China came over to San Francisco. You remember? Oh, and it cleaned up. Cleaned up the streets. So this lady, this lady uh, uploaded uh, a video of her walk from her apartment to her job in, in the streets in, in the Tenderloin District of San Francisco. And so she uploaded this picture of her walk on X, uh, formerly known as Twitter, right? Um, and well, I guess Xi Jinping went out of town. Them streets is filthy, dirty. So she, all she did was literally say she does not feel safe walking down the street. All she did was hold her phone. And take a walk. It was absolute people crapping on the street. Somebody shooting up right in front of her. Half the people naked and passed out. It's a game. It's a game. Because when Jin Jinping showed up, what happened? There wasn't nobody in sight. It looked like a ghost town. Streets was clean. The people were gone. We don't even know where the people went. Overnight, people were saying, we don't know what happened. It's a game. This is the world we live in. What's your thoughts on that? Like, yeah, I mean, we're just seeing more in America the depravity of men. We see that people and leave God. This you're going to see more and more of this keep coming if people keep going down this road. If our country keeps going down this road, this is what's going to keep happening. But I feel like we're saying this every week. Like, I, I'm just trying to raise. I, I, I feel the burden to raise the awareness because we still got people out here playing church. 
Like they don't think there's anything wrong. Like the amount of whack preachers out there, whack preachers looking for their own, uh, looking for their own optics moment to get a picture with politicians that are as crooked as a dog's hind leg. Looking for these optics of trying to get a picture with the mayor who's more compromised than Ahab himself in the Bible. We, we, all these, all these optics. Oh, we got this person like, screw it. If your city council people are not living for Jesus, don't be platforming them. Even, even Jesus said, look at Herod, that sly Fox people like, well, that, you know, that Jesus, you know, he just was no, go look, go research what sly Fox meant back in the day. Go look at what that was actually saying. He was calling out, you know what you, you know, you know who called out somebody, John the Baptist. Do you know what happened to him? It cost him his head. He was calling out these people. And I, I know we beat this a lot, but I'm just saying like this, the world we live in that we got compromised preachers and we got real problems. We got real problems. And, and I'm just thinking to myself, this is this, this is the environment our church is growing up. And then, and then we got, and, and I'm going to bring this up because I saw this sermon and, and this is what I'm talking about. This is the Not Offended Podcast. Thank you for tuning in. We talk about culture and its influence on the church. I want to show you how much culture has came into the church today, the world we live in. I want to show you this. I want you to listen to this preacher and his sermon, and then I want you to hear the pastor who invited this preacher. I want you to hear his close because, you know, this, this is going to shock every viewer who watches this. This preacher had the audacity to say that we shouldn't worship God. God should worship us. Watch this clip. What if God worships me? Can you say that with me? What if God worships me? A God who worships me is quite the statement. I know. But follow me. Now, I get it. We've started to worship a very big, heteronormative white Jesus that we constantly thank for standing between us and a mean God. But really, really, who, what, when, and why? Worship has become so God-centered that it risks the subjective colliding of our own things, our biases, etc. What if worship is us? on the mountain of transfiguration. This space where God spoke that God was well pleased. This place where God spoke about God's son in such a way that the light shone on him and God looked and said, wow. What if worship is Genesis three and eight that says when God says, where are you? And who told you that you were naked? Who told you that there was a flaw in your beauty? The God who meets us and keeps confirming that who we are is good enough. What if that's worship? We declare that you are a God that worships us. That's how much you love us. That's how much you desire us. That's how much you are for us. Or when we step into your presence, We come with our full selves, fully naked and unclothed, and there is no shame because what you have created since the very beginning, you declare good, and it is still good. I, 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 I don't know. He said, he said, wouldn't we all want to, don't we all want to tell God you need to worship me? Hell no. That is not what I'm telling God. You going to get us all in trouble. What was your first thought when you, what, what, is, what did we watch? What was that? Well, if we talk slow like this, I guess we'll be profound and forget the commandments. Heteronormative <laughs> God, white Jesus. Why are they always blaming it on white Jesus? Again, <laughs> you saying crazy stuff is white Jesus' fault. <laughs> no, he crazy. What'd you think? What'd you think? The brother gone, huh? He's gone. Yeah. He going to, is he going to hell? From the sound of it, yeah. <laughs> he said God need to worship you. Yeah, yeah. Where does he uh, get that? Well, obviously, you were on the Mount Transfiguration with God, and God was like, I'm impressed with you. And then everybody ended up being naked. What did he say? And, and then the guy, clo the guy closing at the end was like, we all need to get naked. That, I don't know. And I, I, what? that was a church. 
Bishop, that was a was that a church? It's people getting together with some music and people <laughs> amening. Yeah, what, what person said wow as if that was deep and profound? Oh, mm. <laughs> pray, I don't know. Pray, I don't know you. Pray, you don't know what to tell me. I don't know what to tell That's you. That's a hey, church hey, somewhere. Hey, I I primarily listen to white old conservative <laughs> man preachers. So I listen to. <laughs> Tony Evans, he in there, you know. So there's there's, there's some exceptions, but. but people are actually tuning into that. Are they getting the gospel? That, that, I mean, that wasn't the gospel. No. What 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 is that? Listen, I said it a couple of weeks ago. The devil never tells you come worship me. He says go worship yourself. The devil makes you the highest priority. And this sounds just like the devil. God needs to worship you. Because you're so incredible. It's a whole lot of people finding their authentic selves. I'm telling you right now, there is nobody getting saved in that church. Every person has done drank the Kool-Aid of deception. That, that, that preacher right there works for the devil. He does not work for God. He is not an ambassador. He straight, he said, what if God worshiped me? You know, you know, you know who the only other person to say that was? Lucifer. Yep. He said, everybody should worship me. If that ain't the devil himself speaking through a forked tongue, I don't know what is. This is the world we live in. People just always are searching to feel good or feel important. I mean, I was thinking about this morning. I mean, the, the big reason I'm a Christian is not because it makes me feel good. It's because it's true. More than anything else, the, the, despite the way I feel in the moment, it's like, hey, this is true. And I think people need to come to that realization. It's like, is this true or not? And so it doesn't matter how you feel or in the moment. I mean, I think God wants to give you an abundant life. I think he wants you to feel love. Um, he wants to bring people around you. And he wants to show you that he cares for you. But despite what you feel in the moment, it's still true. And you need to follow through with it. But this guy wants to make you feel good. That God should worship you. It's like, no, you shouldn't. Like, you know, you should give your life for God. And he doesn't owe you anything. But the thing that God owes you something is like, that's not the gospel. And then, and then the, how about the closing pastor at the end? Just going off of whatever tangent he was. That sounds like an occult. That sounds like he's he's one step away from being a cult leader. Am I, am I wrong in that? Or they already are. Or they already are talking about, you know, what if we were in the garden naked? It sounds like you're just asking people to get naked is what it sounded like. Am, am, am I off on that or is that no, one step I mean, away? I, I, wonder where, I mean, I wonder what church this is and like where it's at. And it sounds like some big red church type stuff. I'm telling you. So th- this is the thing that concerns me is there's there's no balance there's no checks and balances and so you get people out here that just think they can just meet in a building put some music on and all of a sudden they're a church and i think that this this is the world i keep saying it this is the world we live in where are the other pastors do you let me ask you do you feel like as a pastor as a defender of the gospel we should be calling stuff out like this or do you think we should just turn the blind eye and be like oh it is what it is they know we can do about it should we not be calling stuff out yeah, I think you should call stuff out. Absolutely. You have a segment of people in the church say that we shouldn't call people out. So what if you don't? I, I'm, yeah, what if you don't? Yeah, I mean, what if you don't? What if we don't call them out? What happens then? Um, I, I guess I'm, as, as you asked that question, what, it specifically, you're, 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 what are you asking pastors to do specifically? From the pulpit, just like go watch videos and go point that out or just... I, I think I think we should point out heresies as they come out. I yeah. think so. So, for example, the Carl Lentz situation, yeah. shouldn't we have called that out? Yeah, I, I guess. As a, sorry, I'm just thinking it through. As if you think things are affecting your congregation, like you know, like maybe you pointed out a pastor to your congregation before, a pastor out to your congregation before, and they sort of get get off. You know, a lot of people in your church are you know listening to that person. You might want to point that out to your congregation. Okay. Okay. So, case in point, if I could, just whatever. In uh, what was that? Uh, was that 2014, uh, 2015? The Supreme Court ruled gay marriage could could happen. That it was the law of the land, and you had a whole bunch of Christians posting rainbows, posting pride flags, love is love, love wins today, and very few pastors got up and said, "Hey, that may be the law of the land, but it's not the law of the Bible. And if you're a believer, you shouldn't be signing off on this. Yes, it's the law of the land." But it's going to come a day where you're going to have to do these weddings or you're going to get thrown in jail. And I found very few pastors 
especially in California, who said, hey, listen, we understand this is the law of the land, but it still does not trump the law of the Bible. And I think that's when the capitulation started. That's when the knee bowing started. That's when pastors started getting scared because people lost a lot of people that day. But it's not our fault if, the, if, if, if Christian believers are in doctrinal error. You have to call out the doctrinal error. But I think that's when it all started. Does that make sense? I feel like we have a, a, a moral duty and obligation to call these things out. Now, of course, it's not comfortable. I mean, I'm not, listen, I'm not saying we need to go and protest. That's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying, hey, let's go out there and let's just start every argument we can and go protest. I'm saying from the pulpit, you, you need to call out the doctrinal heresy and error. That's all I'm saying. And, and in some cases, if it involves a person, you need to call that person out. You need to say, hey, listen, that brother is not, you know, especially if they refuse to get out of ministry. That brother is not walking in accordance to the Bible. We encourage everybody to stay away from that brother. Is that wrong? Or else you get the David Koresh's of the world, the Jim Joneses of the world. I don't, am I making sense? Or, or am, I, am, I over, or am I overreaching, overreacting? No, I think he, he, um, Sunday mornings um, preaching should um, address the culture. And it should, not, not even specifically you have to always point it out, but your sermon should help your people equip, should equip your people to face the culture they're going into. I think Timothy Keller was big on that. Like you want to be able to tear down the gods of the culture um, for your people and to actually help them see the real God. You, 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 am I doing too much or, 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 or you think we have an obligation? Now, listen, I'm not saying you spend the whole hour debunking and attacking everything. But I remember when Todd Bentley, who started talking about he talks to angels and he had an angel specifically to give him money. I was like, we got to call that out. We ain't doing all that because there was people who was actually following him. Man, I don't know any of these you're saying. Okay, well, this this the, he, he had a huge healing ministry this whole nine. It was from 85, D. It was from 85. Oh, dang. That's cold. Well, that didn't be my list. That's yeah, cold. That's know. cold. What I'm saying is we had a duty and obligation because people were starting to listen to him. Like, hey, you don't get no a personal angel who gives you money. That is not in the Bible. Does that make sense? Am I doing too much or is, that, or, or, is this, or is this relevant? We need to call these things out. Yeah, I think there's a couple different layers to it as well. Okay, um, go ahead. In, in the sense of like, if you're thinking of church being a, a community, right? You would, as a, as a congregant in the community, I would want to be believing what everybody else in the community believes. And so there's there's different times where like the rubber meets the road, and something, some hot topic comes up, or some person who comes out with some different, you know, theology or something. And if if the pastor doesn't tell and help teach and guide the congregation and where they're going, then you could be sitting in the seat believing something c totally contrary to what everybody else is in there thinking. Okay. And I think that's what happened with some of the stuff in regards to like the, um, the uh, gay marriage and things is like, P I think people stuck around in conservative churches thinking that they believed the same thing other people believed. And then they come to find out like they don't. And, but that never comes to a head unless it's talked about. Yeah. That, that's what I'm saying. We, we've had a classic case of bury our heads in the sand. Okay, if I can't, because I'm, I'm an equal pursuant of this, okay, just hear me out. I call out stuff, whether it's in the church or outside the church. Like, I remember for years, I would always tell people, hey, yeah, hey, watch what your kids watch. Like, just don't sign off on it too quick. You got to really investigate what your kids is watching from. And by the way, I wasn't the one that got boycott Disney. You know, d don't, don't watch any of these movies. You know, I wasn't that guy, you know. But I was the guy going, hey, you need to make sure you watch what your kids are watching. You got to approve of it. You got to see what's behind it. Lo and behold, a docu-series breaking this week is called All Quiet on the Set. And this is about the, the nefarious activities that was going on behind the Nickelodeon set. And a guy at the forefront of this, I believe his name is Daniel Schneider. And this is a guy who wrote all the hits and there are people coming out and, and, and it's, articles are breaking everywhere talking about Nickelodeon's House of Horrors inside the abuse allegations aimed at Dan Schneider's kid shows. And you got all these people coming out talking about all these things. And it's already aired. And you can find it on TV. And, 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 and I remember saying stuff. Hey, guys, even on Nickelodeon, y'all need to watch what's, be, what's going on here. Where's the little end of windows? So I'm a fair proponent of, of just giving warnings. Right. And that's what I'm saying. I don't feel like, I guess what I'm saying is this, is that part of a pastor's obligation? Should they be doing that? Should they be encouraging the congregation? Hey, you need to watch what your kids are watching. Hey, I don't know about that. Should, should we be watchmen's on the wall or should we just bury our heads in the sand and be like, Hey, I just have an obligation to teach you about the sermon on the Mount. 
I mean, I think we have obligation to um, to lead people holistically, right? And that's every every area of their lives is to help them to be the best the best that they could be in in order to follow Christ. So when, whether that be in their finances, whether that be in their marriage, whether that be in parenting, whether that be in their theology, uh, which encompasses all of that. Um, I think that you would be doing people a disservice if you don't help them in those areas. Now, your approach could be different in the sense of like, you may not do, you know, six weeks of like better finances. Okay. Right. But you may on a Sunday touch on something one time, but then offer people a class during the week when it comes to finances to try to keep it more, um, I don't know. I'm going to say gospel center, but that's not, I, I, hope, know what you, you I hope you understand yeah. what I mean by yeah, that yeah. on a Sunday. Yeah. Um, but it, but to do nothing, I think except for like just one facet of somebody's life, I think that it doesn't really necessarily help them as a whole. Yeah. Cause I talked about yesterday, the primary function of a pastor's lead, feed and protect. I look at this as protecting the sheep from the wolves in sheep's clothing. I don't know. Am I doing too much or, or, or do we have an obligation to call out these things too, and it just encourage parents. Hey, you need to watch what your kids are watching. You need to, you know, how much time they spend on their phones and what apps they have. I, is that doing too much, or is that part of our job now? Yeah, no. I think if if you if you're preaching, I think if you are preaching the gospel, you're preaching the Bible. You're going those things are going to come up, right? Culture is going to come up. Yeah. So because you're, you're teaching them to deal with the culture, so it's like, hey, what does this mean for the people during that time, and how does that apply to us today? And so we have to contextualize what we're talking mm-hmm. about, right? Yeah. So I, I I'm on this kick. Um, I. I you know, the world we live in, if you would have told me, you know, 10 years ago, someone like Joe Rogan and these guests that he's been having on would would be talking about religion as much as they have been. I don't know that that I would have bought in what you were selling. I don't know if I'd have picked up what you were throwing down. Does this make sense? But I found it. Uh, we, we found an interesting clip uh, where Joe Rogan is talking to Lindsay. Uh, I'd have to look up his first name. Do you remember his first name? Maybe James. James. Okay, but it's going to say on the clip. And they start talking about how religion plays a vital role inside a societal community and that religion is the number one, uh, the number one roadblock to totalitarianism and how it literally staves it off and it keeps it at bay because people find a higher purpose and a higher meaning of living. And I want to show this clip because I think it really speaks to a group of people out there who aren't necessarily religious, but they're starting to find the value and that religion plays in a society. Does that make sense? And then we're going to talk about the role in the world we live in today, how religion plays a part in society. But watch this clip. So the people who go along with it, who are in the cult, are treated as people, and the people who don't go along with it have to be treated as non-people. And that's based – Mao Zedong gave a a famous speech in 1957 where he actually said to not have a correct political orientation is like not having a soul. So you're no better than a capitalist running dogs. You're no better than the dogs. Well, I mean we like dogs, but you know what I mean, how Mm -hmm. he would have meant it. And so it's like you're no better than an animal if you don't go along with this. And that's what you're saying. That's a cult. And yeah. all this bears the hallmarks of a cult. And it feels like that is a natural pattern that humans fall into. And I think particularly if you're not religious, I think one of the things about religious people is they've already got their thing, you know, so mm-hmm. and hopefully it's one that promotes good values and it's a good thing. Yeah. But there's a part in the brain that wants that thing. Yeah. And atheists they don't have a religion, and so they find a social religion. They that, find, a social religion, that's yeah. exactly right. That's exactly right. So they find it in their social circumstances, politics, economics, mm-hmm. and it always goes demonic when they do that. I've been spending a lot of time, thanks to Charlie, primarily, Charlie Kirk, I've been spending a lot of time paying attention to the tenets of Christianity and studying it, and it's got a lot of good advice in there. Um, but you're 100% right that if you if you try to lack a religion and the primary thing with the with the religion why so if you if you lack a religion then it'll get filled in with other things for very many people i think there's a small percentage of people for maybe that doesn't apply but there's a spot in your brain for it but the uh the the thing that why do they go after christians and jews so hard everywhere they go and the reason is because they are completely committed to they're not when you say you know they already have their thing For Christians and Jews, that's not how they think about God. It's not their thing. That's something that's above everything else. Well, the Muslims as well. Well, Muslims too. 
But Muslims, Islam's a little bit different because it's got a political element worked into it. And I'm not trying to like throw shade. I'm just saying that with all there is no, the state is never above God in Christianity and Judaism. Ever. The state and God are somewhat intertwined or can be in Islam, but it's not, so they're not quite identical, but it's true. The God is above state, no question. So when the state shows up and says to you, hey, you're going to do X, Y, Z or else, and it goes against your religion, if you're a Christian or Jew and to many, if it's not Islam, a Muslim, you're going to say, no, I have a higher duty and it's not to the state. And if you kill me, I'm going to a better place. So I don't care. And that's the enemy of totalitarianism in a way that nothing else is. The Confucian virtues of China don't have that. Buddhism actually kind of doesn't have that. Okay, so you got any first thoughts on that? I thought that was interesting in saying that when you're a Jew or a Christian, you kind of find your thing and it adds this value to society, but it also staves off, it also keeps at bay totalitarianism. And that's because we say that God trumps the state in whatever that state commands or state laws are. Did you guys find that interesting at all? What, what was your thought on that? Because um, I don't think either of them are very much Christians, but they're recognizing the benefits of having a deep, sincere, enriched faith. You know, I think that's one of the things that we saw with COVID was that you had people who were standing on their beliefs and their faith saying that we're not going to get a vaccine or we're going to keep our church doors open because this is what we believe God is telling us to do. This is what we believe the Bible tells us to do. And you had another segment of the population that says what you need to do what the state is telling you to do. One trumping the other. Okay. Um, and the state definitely not liking you saying, not you, but... The, oh, they the, didn't the, like me. Well, the Christian saying that there was a um, that there was something superior to the state. Right. What What, what did you think about what he said? Um, I like that he threw shade at the Muslims. The, he separated us from them. The guy had no love for them, so I'm happy for that. Um, <laughs> never won. And then the second thing it was that we um, this idea of, of four believers that there is a higher authority that because he goes on to talk about even Christian nationalism and how how they use that word to attack Christians. Um, but this idea that we are, our, our God is above everything else. And that's always going to put America in check. If we, if, if the, most of the people here are believers, we are always going to hold a government to a certain standard. Okay. And we were like, we're willing to defy you because we have this standard. Okay. So let's, let's go back to that. Let's, I mean, we're on the four year anniversary of COVID and you remember they told everybody to shut the doors and, and, and we, um, prayed about it. We thought about it. And we felt like we had a directive from the Lord that we were to open up our church doors. And a lot of people, a lot of Christians even look at that as defilement. They looked as if we were defiling uh, not only the local government, but disobeying and dishonoring God. Now looking back in hindsight, retrospectively, of course, uh, do you think we were vindicated at all? Do you think that we were validated at all? Do you think we did the right thing? Uh, do I think we did the right thing? Yes. Do I think that we're vindicated and validated? Uh, no, in the sense of people who had those views, they're not going to like change. They're still going to write comments about, you know, the state of what COVID was and is. Um, so I don't think that I don't think people's minds in that regard probably have changed. Uh, but maybe to argue with myself out loud a little bit, like maybe there are people who are believers who shut their doors and look back and go, man, I wish I wouldn't have done that. Oh, okay. I guess what I'm getting at, but looking back at it now going, okay, you could go to home Depot, but you couldn't go to church. You don't think there's a segment of people now looking back going, ah, yeah, I can see how that was stupid now. Yeah. I mean, you could go to strip clubs, but you couldn't go to church. Yeah. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff like with COVID. I just, I mean, I have issues with every, everyone, everyone's thoughts and views. Cause it's just part like on like, you know, the liberals like, yeah, like it doesn't make any sense. You, all these things you had to shut the, the doors of the church, certain things. But I mean, Home Depot and Lowe's were packed. Sold I'm, out. Yeah. And I'm seeing the same. I'm going there. I'm seeing the same people all the time. Like we're all just there. Like you got nowhere else to go. Let's go to Lowe's and, you know, I bought a saw, start cutting wood. Start doing <laughs> <laughs> I'm seeing the same people all you the time You became the Bishop Lumberjack. Gosh, I could use a stimmy, by the way. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Those were the good days. I, I could use a stimmy, by the way. Yeah. I was talking to someone about that. We were talking about COVID. They're like, I'm not trying to say COVID was good, but some good parts of COVID. Like, <laughs> <laughs> we all knew what you were talking about. Yeah. yeah. I was like, I know what you're saying. <laughs> yeah. But, but am I, but okay. So looking back at that, that's, I guess that's the part of the stuff that doesn't make sense. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, some parts of it just don't make sense, like the way they, they decide to do things. Okay, do you not remember when when Newsom was doing the colored tier system? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Don't you remember all this? And if we couldn't get out of yellow, we couldn't get out of red, mm-hmm. we couldn't get out of green. I mean, do you guys really look back at this and look at the... And he was the, at the French bakery or whatever he eating was. Eating with all his friends, eat, eating at a five-star Michelin place. This, this, okay, this is... Okay, this is the part that 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 I'm saying. Unless people rise up and we say, listen, this isn't right. You can't say shut the church doors. But then you had all these pastors who literally fell for it hook, line, and sinker. I, I got a question. And I was going to ask you this later because I feel like this is almost a setup. I'm not trying to set you up. Cause, well, yeah, I, you are. Don't lie. No. Well, th- this is the reason I say because you haven't heard the, probably heard the sermon in a while. But the one, um, the honored reward. Um, By John Bevere? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we had talked about, like, I just listened to a um, guy had to teach OSL. And his big thing was like, you are always honor the position. Sure. Um, and then now I'm like, okay, as a believer, how do you, cause if he's like, despite what they do, despite their okay. character, what they do, you still honor their position. And it's like, how do you do that? But also define, it didn't end up defining them in that way. Okay. So we're in the book of Daniel. What happened in the first chapter of Daniel right now? Yeah. He defied him. Okay. The King's command mm-hmm. was what? Drink wine, eat meat. Mm-hmm. And what did Daniel say? Yeah. I don't want to define myself. Give me, God gave him favor. He said, give me 10 days. Hmm. Well, that's the servant. He said, give me 10 days and watch if I'm not in better health. Mm. And what happened? He's yeah. in better health. Okay, then we're going to read here in just a few short chapters about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. What mm. happens? what they do? Yeah, they defy them. Okay, so how do we do this in a biblical way, right? That seems to be the question. Well, first off, we have to go back all the way to our founding fathers. And they wrote this thing called the Constitution, right? And so every person, every sworn official has to, has to uphold these things. And that's why you have the First Amendment, the Second Amendment. Newsom himself, you, th- th- this is what the Supreme Court ruled on. This is, this is what I was confident in, and this is what the Supreme Court eventually ruled on. You can't sign away the First and Second Amendment. You never have absolute power over that. And so what ended up happening was when it finally got appealed all the way to the Supreme Court, and they ruled, I think it was 6-3 or 5-4, it doesn't matter. They said, listen, at no given point and given time, can you absolutely do away with the First and Second Amendment? Now, you could put some, you could put some guardrails on it for a season. In other words, you could have said, hey, church doors stay open, and we need you to keep social distance, which we were already doing, weren't we? So in other words, I went to a higher authority. I said, listen, what Governor Newsom is saying is, is he has a very jaded an abusive look at the First and Second Amendment, and first one in particular, okay, first one in particular. And I said, I am not, I am not going for that. I'm not buying that. I'm not, I'm not kneeling down to that. He is wrongly discerning that I have my right to appeal. Even Paul said, I appeal to Caesar. Well, I appeal to the Supreme Court. He has got a wrong interpretation. Of that. And who ended up winning that? We did as Christians. So who was wrong? Newsom, did he come out and say he was wrong? Did he ever come out and say, hey, guys, I missed that one. My bad. No, he tried to double down even after that. He tried to throw his weight around. So you don't, you don't have to. You, listen, when, when you're appealing, everybody has to abide by those rules. And so there is no honoring, honoring him. It's like him coming out and saying, I'm the king of the law. Now go fornicate right now. How do you honor that? How do you honor if he says, nope, I need you to take a second wife because the population is dipped, so you need to cheat on your wife and you need to go impregnate as many women as you possibly can. Do you agree to that? How, as you a Christian, do you show honor in that way? I don't know. Oh, I'm asking you the question. I don't know. Well, you, do, you don't do it. Oh, okay, yeah, that's what I was hoping you would say. He said he don't know, but no, oh, no, that, no, 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 this is the sermon that he preached. That's what I was asking. He was like, no, you, he was, he, no this, is, this is what he said. You always honor the position. Okay. Weird. Doesn't mean this is this is the worst he said. We're being I'm quoting him. Okay, so is John Bevere right in that? I don't know. I'm literally asking a question. I don't oh know. no, so I'm no, no. John Bevere is wrong in that. Okay. So if John Bevere says, "Hey, the governor comes out and says you need to go sleep with as many women as possible because the birth rate is down and we need mm-hmm. to get everybody pregnant," I look at John Bevere and I said, "You wrongly divided the word." What's so hard about that? I don't think that's hard. Now you don't go around lamb blasting mm. the governor, but I am going to call him out. Yeah, that's and, a hedonism. And to be fair to him, I don't think that's what he was saying. But, but I mean, no, he's saying of, how do you do it in an honorable way? Which mm-hmm. I did. Mm-hmm. I said, hey, listen, 
do not forget, we were the, to my knowledge, and I could be wrong, we were the only church in town who did the multiplicity of services. My gosh, we ran so many different types of services in so many different types of ways. I don't think we could even keep track. So we did try to meet in the middle. But when you have a totalitarian as a governor who says it's going to be my way or no way and I'm going to penalize you and fine you and you have people from the city who come by and they do all this stuff, then no, you don't got to give in. If next thing you know, they'll be asking you to turn in the Jews. And that, and that what happened in World War II? And that what happened in the European countries? You kept giving them more power, more power, more power. Next thing you know, they, what, what did Bonhoeffer say? First they came for this. Next they came for that. And every time I said nothing. And then they came for the Jews and I said nothing. Next thing you know, they came for me. Sooner or later, you got to get up and you got to push back. If not, just think about where we would be. And that's all I'm saying is you look back now and you got to be able to call these things out. That, 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 that's all I was getting to. And this is what he was saying. Totalitary people fear religious people because we have the stance of your laws do not trump God's laws. And this is why they always look to get rid of us first. And they always look to marginalize us and quiet us. And that's exactly what's going on. That's the world we live in right now. Tell me I'm wrong. No, I, I started the segment off by saying the same thing. So, I, I mean, I, I, I agree. Um, you know, I think that I was just thinking while you guys were talking about what the thought is for the believer who basically says, you know, uh, in regards to like COVID, for instance, that, you know, you should, you should go along with everything the government is telling you. Um, you have pastors who did that, though. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so why don't they come out and say they're wrong now? Hey, we missed that. We were wrong. People don't like saying they're wrong. There, there, there are very few people who come out with a press conference and said I was wrong. Okay, but how hard is it to say, hey, listen, I missed it on that. I should have allowed every pastor to make their own decision. I shouldn't have cast any judgment or dispersions. I should have just, hey, man, everybody's free to do what God has called them to do. And it's all in context. So I'm not going to speak out against it. I don't think that people in power, especially pastors, like to apologize because they feel like it discredits them. And so for the next time that they try to put their foot down about something, that if they have said they were sorry about one thing, that they, it will discredit for them for the next time when they do do that and people go, well, they're going to be wrong about this one. What do you think? You asked the question. I gave you an answer, but no, I think this idea. is what we have to be careful. Is I think as as pastors, you take something that's true. I mean, I think that sermon's good by John. Bevere. I'm not I'm not saying the sermon's bad, but if you take something and make it this absolute, and you got don't, you not contextualized, you, and then you and you get pastors who think that way. And again, what, what John Bevere is saying is is true. But if you take that to this extreme and you never give any context or give it other examples, this is where it, it can lead to. Mm. And so I think as pastors, we sometimes we have to be careful. You, you might, you're okay. speaking the truth, but okay. I mean, literally in OSL 3, we, I had someone argue with me about something in front of the whole class, but I didn't argue with them. I just let him just go, I'm like, I'm not, I, don't, I didn't want to argue with about it. And then <laughs> after the class, he came and talked to me and we had a discussion and then I realized we had good, it was a good discussion because like, I understand what you're saying now. He, he just what he told me. I was like, you're, you're making scripture say something it wasn't really saying. Um, it, it could be true, but it's not saying that. And we have to be careful that we make sure we give context. And it's not always this absolute, this caveat to certain things. There's, it's not always black and white and everything that. Okay, let me, let, me, let me ask you a question and, and, we'll, and, we'll, and we'll get some closing thoughts. Talking about honoring, talking about the world we live in. Um, really, I see totalitarianism as an abuse of power. Okay, okay. Have a friend. Uh, he, he, he wants to church plant and he's extremely gifted and he feels called to a certain area. He went to his pastor and his pastor said, under no uncertain terms, can he go plant in that area? Even though this person feels called, he feels led, he feels like this is where God wants him. His pastor said, if you do this, I will take it as a sign that you're trying to divide the church and that you are being blatantly disrespectful and a rebellion to me. Who's right and who's wrong? The... Um the one that wants to start the church. Why is he wrong? Um, if if he wants the blessing of this pastor, he's going to honor. He needs to honor him. What say you? Or why go to him? Yeah, yeah. It's it's hard. It's hard, especially if you're like, I really believe that this is what God is telling me to do. Okay. But I also think that God will bless you if you're honoring that person. Okay. Like, so let's say you missed it. Okay. I think that God will still you, you bless don't, you. You don't think that pastor's out of bounds? 
Uh, so are you saying like that pastor is maybe feeling some, some sort of way? Like a I half my congregation is gonna be gone. We're talking. We're talking about a major metropolitan city like in Los Angeles. Talking millions of people. Oh, and and you can't even plant in the same city. You can't plant. You can't plant. You can't plant within a hundred mile radius. Okay, so if he's wrong, and it's not necessarily immoral, unbiblical, or unethical, mm-hmm. and he's and you go to him as your pastor. When 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 are, when are you allowed to politely disagree and say I I, I think we need to bring in another person because I don't think I don't, I don't think that's the Lord I don't I'm not discerning the spirit of God there. Oh, I think you could do that in that point. You think you could do that in that point? I don't know. Well, why not bring in somebody else? I don't know. What you mean? What you don't know about? I I, just, I don't know. I, I I just I don't know. I don't know. You, I, I, I could make up something. What we two by <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I think it's, I think it's absolutely acceptable to bring in somebody else because what I'm hearing is this. But what if the other person says the same thing? What he? What if he agrees with the pastor, the lead pastor? Oh, that's fine. I, I, I still, I, I still think that's a way out of bounds request. The ministry's not yours. It's God's. You're not, are you building your kingdom or are you building the kingdom? Yeah, so if you're worried about your pastor. If, 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 if this person has served you honorably mm-hmm. the entire time he was on staff or they was on staff, or his husband, wife, it doesn't matter, whatever, right? If they served you faithfully the entire time, helped you grow what you're currently established right now for the, king, the kingdom, not your kingdom, then what does it matter? Plant the people. Who cares? And if they take people, glory be to God. They're not serving the devil. Oh, I'm not saying that he's right, but I mean, if we're talking about honor. But I think it's okay to push back. I think it's okay to say, hey, listen, can we pray about that? What are your concerns? Can we really have dialogue? Can we be mature believers about this? Can we be kingdom people about this? Can we bring in another person? I don't think that it's dishonoring to continue a conversation. Mm. But to say the words, if you do anything outside of this, I'll take it as a sign of you're trying to divide the church and you're trying to be rebellious. Mm. Yeah, I have a word for that. That's called manipulation. That that ain't right. That ain't right. Okay, but I feel like we're not. I feel like we're arguing two different things. What What are we arguing? Well, you had. I, I felt like you asked. What is is it honoring for him to go along with it? Yeah, if you have a bad pastor, get out of there. <laughs> why is he still, why is he still your pastor yeah, yeah. no no i'm not saying they're a bad person they're having a bad moment what? see but, we, we, you got to delineate between this person being insecure and having a bad moment and this person being a bad pastor every well, spiritual bad manipulation moment. doesn't sound like it's being a good pastor well this case in this case it's not good yes then you're hoping he's gonna turn around if he's a good pastor no what i'm no, what i'm saying is where in other words where does the line of honor stop when you be spiritually manipulated, but because because no matter what, people are going to see it as dishonoring. It, the, 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 the the dishonor and the honor is subjective to the eye of the beholder. It's to the interpretation. I wouldn't have had no problem if this particular person said, hey, 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 "Slow down a minute. We need to bring in another person. We really need to dissect this." And at the end of the day, if they had a conversation and they mutually agree, okay, how about a compromise? I won't do anything in this area for a year. That gives everybody time to transition. And to do what they're going to do. Because let me tell you a secret. Let me tell you something. After been doing this for years now. Those people who are already on the fence about leaving, they ain't going to stick around through this no matter what anyway. You're going to lose those people. Yeah, but you didn't give us all those scenarios. You just asked us about the first one. Oh, did I set y'all up? That's what I'm yeah, we just had like, how I mean, kind of like how you set me up a minute ago. Did I set y'all up? Is that, is that what no, I, I, I gave up warning. I told you. <laughs> then you came out the pastor's evil, uh, hates evil. No, I didn't say any of that. I did not say any of that. I'm just, that. that's what I'm saying. This is why pastoring is an art and not a science. This is why you have to take in all the information. This is why when you hear these things, you got to do investigation. You just can't line up. And I feel like so. So many pastors just line up and sign off on things. No, this is the world we live in. You got to get up and you got to speak out against these so things. So this guy who's wanting to plant, he he wants to he wants this person to stay his pastor. 
Oh, I, I, I don't know. I, I just, I, I gave you what I got. That's all I got. I just oh. throwing that out. But this is the world we live in. I feel I, we have an obligation to lead, feed, and protect in the world we live in. And we have to start to call these things. Okay, final thoughts. Give me your final thoughts. This is the adventure. You know, this is the Not Offended podcast. And we're talking about some things here. We, we went on an adventure today with all this stuff. But the world we live in. Man, you got any nostalgic memories of your of growing up? I mean, what'd you grow up with? Early two thousand, but you had the Backstreet Boys, and you know you had NSYNC. You know what I'm saying? You, you had those bands. I'm I'm talking about good music back in the day. Uh, I was born in '84, so Woo, I'll, I'll be out. I'll be 40 this year. Look at that! Hey, hey man, you're getting wiser and mature. This is good. Yeah, uh, I know everybody's. So you saying that's older? What? 40s old. Uh, well, how old are you? When were you born? He'd be 38. 86. He'll be 38 this yeah. year. Oh, so he was born in '88. 86. 80, 86. Okay. Well, you getting there too, son? Yeah, no, this, I'm this, not. I'm embrace not throw, it. Throw shade on him. Oh, this <laughs> is his old. <laughs> hey. We're in agreement. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so go ahead. So, so uh, the world nostal- we live in. Talk n- to me about nostalgic the nostalgic moments. In. Being able to ride your bike outside and not worry about Chester coming to, uh, you know, kidnap you. Um, is it Chester now, or is it Chelsea, or is it? Chalester, <laughs> what do we got? Uh, uh, nostalgic moments, being able to play outside, kids on the kids playing outside. Period. Basketball hoops in in you know outside, kids playing different games in the summertime. Like you, I mean, you don't see that. You you see kids playing in pools behind people's backyards, but like that's it. So the, the streets are empty in a bad way. The world we live in. Well, I know up in Portland, the streets are empty because of all the drugs on the streets and all the stuff. Yeah. And, you know, the world we live in. What advice would you would you say to somebody out there about the world we live in? What would you tell them? Uh, advice on the world that we're living in. Um, get involved in regards to, um, like, your kids. I think that's a big one that I have is just get try to figure out as much that's going on in my kids' lives. So I'm involved at the school. I'm involved on the sports teams. I'm involved. Like I had somebody tell me the other day, they were like, so are you the coach? And I said, no, I'm not the coach. No, no, no. She said, she said, hey, are you the coach? I said, yeah, I'm the coach. And she said, wait, you're the coach? And I said, yeah, I'm the coach. And she goes, no, who's the coach? I go, I'm my daughter's coach, period. <laughs> okay, always going to be the coach. And she goes, no, but who's the real coach? I want the real coach. Yeah. <laughs> 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 made that person work, you again. Like, yeah, man, yeah, you made that person so hard, hard, boy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but I'm I'm involved. I got I'm you. involved. So get involved. Yeah, <laughs> the world we live. <laughs> all these stupid Christians, man. Right, man. <laughs> the world we live in. D, what you got for him out there? Uh, I don't know. No, Mike made me think of. Uh, I live in like a, a newer neighborhood, so it's like a lot of the young families. So it is. It's actually a lot of kids play outside. But I kept thinking, because my kids been asking to go outside, especially as it gets um, darker later. Can they go outside in the front yard? I keep debating if I'm going to let them go out there without watching them. I was like, you can go in the backyard. But I was like, as a kid, I did that all the time. Even my parents were super strict. Um, but they still let me go outside. I feel like it was always safe. I never felt unsafe. Now I'm thinking, man, I'm going to let my kids go in the front yards. I don't trust any you people out here. But it was crazy. Some kid came to my door, I think two days ago, and it was like, hey, can you take me to somewhere? I'm like, what the heck? That was weird. I'm like, where are your parents at right now? I could kill you right now. Like, you're, no one even know. Like, I'm like, this is a trip. Like, why are you here? Anyways, it was just, it was just weird. But it was like, it was just like an old school thing. I remember going to around the corner to like the hell was out of house that would like sell candy and stuff and sell different things. Like, and especially like, I forgot what they call it. Oh, the candy store. It wasn't, it wasn't it was the candy house, something like that. I forgot what it was called. Like in like a lot of black neighborhoods will have that. And it's going to be, you mean your parents trust you to go there, buy some candy, buy something. They'll have like a, the styrofoam cups and I have like frozen Kool-Aid. It ain't, oh, yeah. You go get stuff like that and walk back home. And yeah, that was a different time. Yeah, I was told, hey, you can't ride your ba- p- bike past this street and this mm-hmm. street. Other than that, neighborhood's free. Yeah, I think about the world we live in. And just, just the other day, I walked to the grocery store and I saw the Girl Scouts. And they were out there selling their cookies. And I try to make it a habit of buying as much as I can, just seeing what's in my wallet. And I try to make it a habit of like buying everything off the table. And then I'll just give the cookies away. And the reason I do that is I remember going around with the world's famous chocolate candy bars. If you sold X amount of chocolate candy bars and you got to win a trip to like the, the pizza place back in the day was Naughty Nick's Pizza. And you got to play video games and eat pizza. What? Naughty Nick's Pizza. 
It, this is what it was called. It was just a pizzeria. Where Where'd was you grow up at? Stockton. All right. Don't go to Stockton, people. That's what you just found out. <laughs> what, what, it was Naughty me. Nicks? You said Naughty Nicks? Naughty Nicks. It was, it was a pool bar. You had video games. I Man, haven't that's seen this much emotion yeah, out I, of him. Since the whole podcast. Sick. I didn't go to a strip club, Deshaun. <laughs> 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 With, well, Nicks, that's what you just shout out shout out to the 209 shout everybody you know you, you know you from stockton once i dropped that all right but the point of the matter is i remember going around and i remember selling these things and whether the candy bars was for that or to go to great america or something of that of that nature i remember doing this is the world we live in I remember going to my friend's house, riding my bikes, and just before the street lights came on, you had to be a certain place. You had to make a phone call. We didn't have pagers and cell phones, but I think we were happier. I think there was a sense of community. I remember going down to the 7-Eleven, to the quick stop, being able to get these things. Now, here's the crazy thing. I didn't have all the amenities. I didn't have the money. I didn't have the access to the internet and all these things, but I felt like my childhood was happier. I felt like because what I did have was friends who I could go to the playground with. We could throw the football around. We could play a quick game of three-on-three basketball. We could do these things that kids do. We could pick on each other. We could tell stories about our older siblings. And I think this is the world we live in now where kids don't play in the street. It's not safe. Where kids are asked questions about sexual identity when they're just trying to figure out if they could jump off this this roof or not, not get hurt. How do I how do I do this and not get hurt? Because if I get hurt, my parents would be mad. And now we've come to a place now where we have to fight for these things. As believers, we have to take back our neighborhoods. We have to take back these school boards. We have to do these things. If we want to grow up with the sense of nostalgia that we had. So it was safe to go and man, can you even afford a candy bar right now? But if we want our kids to have some type of, of semblance of this, some, some, some type of something that where they can look back as they get closer to 40 and say, hey, my childhood wasn't that bad. We have, we have to be the people who fight for that. We have to present that. We have to create the spots where it's fun to hang out with the pool tables and the, the basketball hoop out in front. And, and we have to encourage that today. I just want to say to you out there, get involved. Do these things. Make this the world you want to live in, not the world that you actually live in. Be, get out there. Uh, take the initiative and make something happen. And above all, do that in your church to say, hey, listen, we, we want to be involved. We want to make this the place to hang out. I remember youth group was the place to hang out. Make that the place to hang out in your community. And you know what? Don't complain about the youth group unless you're willing to help out in the youth group and say, listen, let's create that environment where kids love to attend this place because this is the spot to be at. I want to encourage you to be the difference that you want to see because this is the world we live in and let's, there's still hope and let's make it the best place. This has been the Not Offended Podcast. Peace. We'll see you next week.